Hello and welcome to the Little Knowledge podcast, where this time we'll be talking about Dunraven Castle, where we're touching on all sorts of things, piracy, spiritualism, and uh, if it's the first time you've uh, found us, maybe by accident, um, basically what we do is we don't lecture you. Um, I mean, I've got my notes. If I'm quoting something, I have notes and I have a little timeline. But apart from that, it's sort of sitting down with a cuppa and having a chat about some of the incredible historical places we have in Southeast Wales. Now, the we involved, I'm Paul Busby, and I have with me, I feel like a sort of a 14th century Welsh aristocrat because I have my own bard with me. But I have to say, this particular bard isn't as complimentary to me as he should be quite often. Um, he was the bard of Betis. I guess he is now the muse of Malpas. We have Goff. Hello, Goff. Hello, how are you? Hello, everybody. Greetings to you. Yeah, I, well, I say, yes, I'm amused. Isn't that very nice? Yeah, I, I, I know inspire others. I float in on a whim, <laughs> generally with feather wings. Yes, very, yeah, uh, mm, yes, very good. So I'm your, I'm your bard. I'm your official bard. A retainer, an old retainer. That's what I am. <laughs> an old retainer who I have to do homework for because we, our last video was uh, Sam Pierre. And Goff did, do you remember the homework you set me, Goff? You did set me some homework. Oh, yes, but there's a picture with a puzzling word on it. Oh, yes, there we are. Now, this is uh, Henry Martin. Yeah. Henry Martin was, um, he signed the death warrant of King Charles I. And uh, years later, he was kept in prison for nearly 20 years at Chepstow Castle, which is why we have Martin's mm -hmm. Tower at Chepstow Castle. And he used to go to uh, Saint Pierre near Chepstow. He was a friend of the Lewis family of Saint Pierre of Chepstow, but Goff wondered why this portrait had now on it, and I had no idea. Uh, but according to the National Portrait Gallery, they believe that the now was added later, so it was painted then, the now was added, and it's supposed to stand for when do we kill the king? Now. Uh, oh, oh, interesting. Because as we know, Henry Martin was not uh, yeah. backward in coming forward with his beliefs. No, was he? no, no. When do we kill the king? No. Wow, fascinating. I'm afraid so. Yeah. Well, well, well. Thank you, Paul. You're, you're, you're very welcome. I hope I get <coughs> at least a pass in C for that whole. Yeah, at one. least. Yeah, possibly a possible <laughs> C10. <laughs> well, here we are. Today is Dunraven Castle, which I like to think is a bit of a mm. sister episode for our St. Donuts castle episode because we're just a little bit north along the coast from St. Donat's Castle in the Vale of Glamorgan and here we have the castle itself. We're quite close to Bridge End but we're closer to the village of Southern Down. I'm sure a lot of our viewers will know it. They may well go for the extraordinary walks there where you have a look beautiful views over the Bristol Channel and also Dunraven Bay which might be famous for some Doctor Who fans as Bad Wolf Bay. Uh, in oh, hey. oh, right. Blimey. Oh, that's good. <laughs> it's all Wales, Doctor Who these days. Isn't yeah, well, it? yeah. And this was became known as the witch's nose. You can see oh. it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, it does go. Uh, in fact, the original name of Dunraven, Dunraven as ever, is a corruption of the original, which is Dindrivan which means fortress of three rocks or triangular fortress. And again, we're in the part oh. of the country with Iron Age hill forts. Yeah. And we, again, people add legends that it, this mm. was where Caractacus, Caradog lived. And it even adds it into the line of King Tudrig, who we talked about in our previous podcast. Oh, this yeah. Might have been where King Tudrig's fortress was. And all the way down to the last of the Glamorgan princes, Yestin, who was deposed by another chap that has appeared quite a lot on this podcast, the Norman Lord Robert Fitzhamon, the conqueror of Glamorgan uh, oh. in about 1090, that sort of thing. And he conquers the place and yeah. he parcels out land to his followers because that's the way it works, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah. And he passes it on. The lordship of Ogmore nearby is given to William de Londres, William of London in 1093. Now, it's not William de Lange that we really need to focus on, but his butler, mm. his steward, who went by the name of Arnold Boutellier, literally Arnold Butler. And the surname oh, became uh, Butler. Yeah, because, 
Uh, Ogmore Castle, the home of William de Lange, when he wasn't there, was attacked. And it was the butler or the steward, Arnold, who heroically defended it above and beyond the call of duty. Now, I wouldn't attack the mm. castle defended by Hudson from uh, upstairs, downstairs, or castle <laughs> from Downton Abbey, because they are formidable. <laughs> this is the original yeah. butler, you could say. Yeah, and sure. as a reward, he was knighted and given Dunraven. So the oh, butler oh, family oh. were perhaps mm. the first to build a stone building at mm. Dunraven. He was given Dunraven, but the tradition says that if ever the Lord of Ogmore, William de Lange, turned up, they had to um, honour him with three cups of wine. Three cups of wine will be drunk in honour of the yeah. Lord of Ogmore. I'm sure he was quite happy, uh, Mr. <laughs> Butler, to get a huge estate just for that little bit yeah. of tradition. <laughs> yeah. And interestingly, years later, a incised slab was found in 1834 a memorial to one of the later butlers, the early Tudor butlers. Mm. And uh, this is recorded by Ian Hutchinson of Bridgend and District History Society. Mm. And if you look at this slab, if we zoom in, you can see three. Oh, cups. yeah. The three cups. Three covered cups of the butlers. Yeah. That became their crest. Oh, right. Gosh. Which is also why Southern Down, the nearby village, has their local called this. Ah, <laughs> the three golden cups. Yeah, oh, brilliant. The three golden <laughs> cups. Oh, and how wonderful. <laughs> the butlers hung on, you know. They hung on. I, I, their building, their Dunraven, whatever form it was in, was probably destroyed or badly damaged during the Owain Glyndua rebellion. Mm. Um, but they had carried on until the 16th century, until Tudor times, really, when the last mm. of the butlers, Anne, married Richard Vaughan. And it's hard to know how Dunraven looked then, but it wasn't a castle. I mean, this is about 200 years later, and it's called mm. Dunraven House by this point. Mm. And it looks to oh, me nice. as if there's a bit of the Tudor house of the Vaughans you can still see here. Yeah. How much of the older castle is hidden by there's these There's an walls. interesting sort of semicircular thing there that could have been a round, a round um, turret as well. It's something there, isn't there? You see it in the far in the corner, corner of the building where the two two wings join. Yeah, I think where this That's an house... odd little thing. That looks like a circular staircase. There, you can see the way the windows are placed. It could well have been. This is another one, so you can see where it is. Uh, the wall gardens mm. is still there, and you have yeah. Dunraven House. I would have expected from our experience of looking at these houses, Goff in Glamorgan near the coast, that they must have had a watchtower at some point. It, yes, I would. Yeah, more than likely, isn't it? But we actually have now Richard Vaughan's son has our first great story. He was known as the Wicked Lord of Dunraven. <laughs> and I know you like bad guys. <laughs> this was Walter Vaughan. And Walter Vaughan, it was said, was an ingenious fellow. But his downfall was his inordinate vanity. And one day at Dunraven, near the coast, of course, always near the coast, um, he saw a shipwreck. And not caring about his own safety, he took a rope, he swam to the vessel, and he saved the entire crew. Oh, gosh. And he devised ways to save lives. And he put it into a report, which he passed to, to government in London. And the government ignored it completely. <laughs> at that that's point, difficult. that Walter Vaughan decided, well, that's it with London. And he hmm. decided, it altered him completely. He decided to revive the Welsh chieftains of old. And he ignored London and he started spending lots of money on being a Welsh chieftain. He spent Ooh. a fortune, too much money, and he wasted mm. all of his money until the castle was deserted, the money was gone, and his friends departed. It got so oh, bad that it's a shame. Elder... <laughs> yeah, it's a shame, really. Because yeah, he's really trying to save started, lives. Yeah, because it all started from me trying to do something quite honourable, wasn't it? You know? yeah. <laughs> You went off the rails when no one listened. <laughs> That's true. Um, yeah. His eldest son, however, decided to go abroad to work with what we think was a merchant uncle. And all this information comes from a Welsh document from 1650. So it's, you know, maybe 100 years in the future, but it's clearly based on an oral tradition and some truth. But take it for what it's worth. So the eldest son goes abroad to work with a merchant uncle to try to revitalize the Vaughan family fortunes. Um, one day there was a wreck 
and uh, it helped replenish his coffers a little bit because, uh, as we've already said, the Lord of the Manor, by from Saxon times on, got all the money that was sort of cast up by the sea. So if a wreck happened, you were the Lord of the Manor, you got the value as long as no one survived from that wreck. Hmm. And that got the slightly twisted and bitter by now, Walter Vaughan thinking. And he decided oh, <laughs> he had an old, fre uh, old rival called Matt of the Iron Hand. <laughs> a former pirate who at one time Walter Vaughan had had arrested. And during the arrest, um, Matt lost a hand and replaced it with a hook, hence Matt of the Iron Hand. Iron. But he decided that, that he was the man to give advice on <coughs> wrecking. So the two of them went into business as wreckers. They were never seen by day, but by night near the caves of Dunraven, he would meet his shady accomplice and they would tempt ships onto the rocks of Dunraven Bay, quite often simply by putting lights and lamps on cattle near the shore. And if you're in trouble, you see a light, you think it's a yeah. ship heading to safety and you are wrecked and the money goes to the Vaughans of Dunraven mm. and probably a cut, of course, to Matt of the Iron Hand. So they did become wreckers, that most despicable mm. of occupations at the time. Uh, but there was a tragedy because two of his sons headed out about a, about a mile and a half away from Dunraven to some rocks on a boat. Um, and they were there and their boat drifted away. They didn't tie it up. And there was no boat at Dunraven. So Walter Vaughan could only see as the sea engulfed the rocks and his, he saw his two sons drowned oh, in baby. front of his oh. eyes. Oh, sure. The only one left was this son who'd gone off to be a merchant. Hmm. Walter Vaughan, who lost another son during this period, had his last son left and he could just hope that his son would return home with some money. Mm -hmm. waiting for this. And then one evening, direct quote from this document, one evening, such a ship approached the Welsh headlands. Vaughan had not been long in his cave before the false lights of the ex-pirate threw a lurid light across the breakers. Listening intently, Vaughan heard above the howling wind the crashing sound of a ship being thrown on the rocks, wild and broken cries for help. Then all was silent. Now, what happened next? We are going to go. Oh do you God. remember when we did Colin Dolphin? Oh, yes, the famous Colin Dolphin. And do you remember who did the artwork for Colin Dolphin? Oh, yeah, yeah yes. <laughs> the primary school children. <laughs> it was Wick and Marcross Primary School over a yeah. decade ago. And guess yeah. what, Goff? They're back. <laughs> oh, I love them. <laughs> oh, it's, oh, it's, yes, it's, uh, it's Mrs. Iron, Iron Hand. Hand. Yeah. Oh. Now, Matt of the Iron Hand has realized that the one survivor from the wreck was none other than the heir to Dunraven himself. Oh. Seeking vengeance, yeah. he'd never forgiven Walter Vaughan for losing his hand. Mm -hmm. Matt of the Iron Hand saw him alive and chopped off his hand and killed him. Oh, gosh. That is the story. What he a then charmer. Oh, I know. Brilliantly done by the primary school kids. Yeah. He then takes the hand to Walter Vaughan. Oh, gosh, <laughs> they are me. He <coughs> Shows him the hand mm. and the ring, the Vaughan mm. family ring that was on the hand. Mm. This is my favorite. He shows it to Walter Vaughan. Oh, 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 look at the, look at the grin on the face. Isn't that wonderful? The grin of Matt <laughs> of the Iron Hand yeah. and the glow is almost Tolkien-esque on yeah. the Vaughan yeah. ring. And it is said afterwards that uh, if you see a man, a figure on the coast of Southern Down and Dunraven wailing, it is probably the spirit of the wicked Walter Vaughan, the wrecker of oh. Dunraven Castle, or someone yeah. who's escaped from the three Golden Cups pub in Southern Down, I would have thought, <laughs> after a heavy evening. <laughs> it's a great story, oh though, God. isn't it? It is, it is. It, what oh, shocking, though, really. What dreadful thing. A dreadful set of circumstances. And he got into bed with the wrong man there, didn't he? Really? Dear me. Who was just waiting oh. for the moment. Yeah. Well, also the thing as well, because as, as he was the last survivor, he said they couldn't claim any money unless all of them had died. 
True. So he obviously made the logical conclusion, well, you know, right? It's not only an opportunity for revenge, but he, he gets the money as well. I'm afraid oh, so. Yeah. Um, but a bit of, of respectability, work. temporarily at least, hmm. um, because eventually the Vaughns sell up and they sell up uh, in 1642 to the Wyndham family. The Wyndhams had land in the forest of Dean uh, and they, they moved to Dunraven. And they became MPs for Glamorgan. But uh, this is uh, Charles uh, Wyndham, you can see here, and his little son, Thomas Wyndham, who mm. actually is a big part to play in the history of Dunraven mm. Castle. Um, Charles as an MP is pretty much as you would expect. It was written of him. Um, it was written of him. Well, I've lost me, me direct quote. Oh, here he is. This gentleman possesses of a large fortune in the county of Glamorgan, and it was probably due to the influence of that consideration alone that he owed the honour of his parliamentary delegation, as he is not distinguished for any other circumstance than oh, the omnipotent good. one of enjoying £10,000 a year and being the modern Nimrod of the neighbourhood. So we've oh, seen really? a lot of MPs like that, haven't we? Yeah. Well, that's another lovely little uh, intimate portrait of holding hands. That's only the second one we've seen, isn't it? Holding his son's hand there. It is. You're quite right yeah. about that. And so his you, son... You, you know, so you notice it if you go through how formal these paintings are, and in a way how distant they are. And when you do see these little moments of affection and in intimacy in them, it's quite... They stand out. They do, don't they? Um, his little son, Charles uh, Wyndham, did... Uh, Thomas Wyndham, sorry, did take over the estate, did become MP for Glamorgan, and he was very popular in the area. He was the one who rebuilt Dunraven House as a castellated mansion in about 1802 to about 1806. Oh, right. So yeah. then it, re it got the name again, Dunraven Castle, but it was, mm. wasn't really a castle. It was a sort of a mock stately home yeah. with battlements, that sort of thing. Mm. Uh, he did become MP. He was popular in the area, um, but he, he didn't really like going to Parliament very often. <laughs> He's like the kid who played hooky from school quite a lot. <laughs> and his excuses, I mean, one of them was, oh, to Lord Bute, I think this was, oh, I am much mortified at not being able to attend Parliament, but the injury I received in my ankle at the time my leg was broke is so great that I am now unable to put it to the ground. I can't, I can't come. <laughs> but he did that a lot until later yeah. in his career the, the local constituents accused him really of negligence just never no. go into parliament yeah. the fact that he was a, a well-known sportsman in glamorgan suggests he was perhaps more physically robust than the house of yes, Commons realized. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he did uh, but he did become friends uh with a man we'll talk about a little bit later on uh yolo morganug and uh, we'll chat oh, about him a yeah. little bit later on. He died in 1814, did Thomas Wyndham, mm. and his daughter took over, Caroline. Here's Caroline Wyndham. Mm. So she was the heir. And uh, I spent last night reading a, an extremely good thesis on Caroline Wyndham by Odette Clark of the University of Limerick. This is how I spend my evenings, by the way. Well, yeah, it, it's nice to have Bobby. <laughs> yes. And she's a fascinating character. She's involved in the architecture. She's involved in rebuilding things. Uh, and of course, she's a good catch because she's taken mm. over Dunraven estate with the coal, which was found in the 19th century. It meant it was an extremely wealthy estate. Mm. Uh, and she ended up marrying an Irish aristocrat called Wyndham Henry Quinn. And they changed Lord. the family name to Wyndham Quinn. And Wyndham Henry Wyndham Quinn, <laughs> yeah, yeah. as he was said, his father yeah. uh, actually became an earl. And his father became an earl. And it's interesting, the earl didn't take the earldom of Adair in County Limerick, where he was from. He took his mm. title from his daughter-in-law. He became the first earl of Dunraven. Oh, interesting. So clearly this Irish peer is thinking that Dunraven is where the money is. Yes. Not a dare yeah. in County yeah. Limerick. Yeah. Um, and the two of them. And in time, this chap here did become the second Earl uh, of Dunraven. And she did become, Caroline became the Countess of Dunraven. Oh. And she was very good at building things. And uh, this is a little bit, can I make that a bit bigger? There we are. This is the oh, castellated yeah. mansion created by her father. Thomas Wyndham, mm. and you can see they've got a tower there in the middle. Well, mm. Caroline actually got rid of that tower 
this oh, looks right. like this. I, I can't fix this at all from the geography I know, but it looks like mm. a watchtower, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, 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 similar. Yeah, really does have something going on there. Just to bring it up a little bit, you go back there a moment. I think there's a, um, I'm starting to spot a number of things here. Mm. A number of pictures that we've had, those illustrations. If you go back a moment, go back to the illustration, bring him up a bit. Okay. In the bottom corner there, you can see, oh no, that's it, bottom corner, drawn yeah. by J.P. Neal. Oh yeah, We've JP seen Neil. that name lots and lots of times in this type of illustration. Yeah, yeah the late 18th, That's early 19th century, JP Neil was the man to go to for this sort of thing. Yeah. So yeah, you because have... there's a stylistic look to them, isn't there? You can see that you can see the the the, the artistic input of one man with them uh, in the in the in the number of the pictures that we've seen. But I've just sort of again, you, you spot his name time and time again in these illustrations of these big houses. Absolutely. He is the man to go to at that time yeah. in that sort of Regency and just before period. So it, it's now a very Gothic, a kind of a Gothic style, castellated mm. mansion. Uh, but she made a, a huge decision to get rid of the central tower that we saw there. Oh, yes. And I've never yeah. seen this before because she replaced it with a conservatory. D yes, it's peculiar. So you would walk into the conservatory before yeah. you got to the entrance hall. So the year isn't here in later years, you see the conservatory. There. Isn't that unusual? And here is how the conservatory. Yeah. Oh, excuse me, back's going. Oh, how very, very odd. So you walked through that to get to the house. You walked through a conservatory yeah. to get to the house. Gosh, that's I've never no, I've, I've never come across that anyway. No, it's an odd thing. Um, yeah. I do like I do like the, the sort of different things that Dunraven Castle had as a house. This is different. Yeah. And so is the fact that their butler didn't use a, a dinner gong. He actually used a bell from a wreck that had been washed up. <laughs> so he would bang, <laughs> almost fitting, yeah. isn't it, for where we are? Yeah, he would quite, bang yeah. <laughs> a, a ship's bell made in Glasgow. No one died during the wreck, so they thought no. that was fine, rather than a dinner gong. Yeah, slight echo of the wreckers, though, isn't it? Oh, the, you can't get away from Wreckers and Dunraven, I don't think. That really is their thing. Uh, mm -hmm. But yes, you've got the normal sort of stately home sort of atmosphere. Mm. This is Caroline in later years. Um, I do think about Caroline that, uh, of course, as soon as, she, as soon as her husband dies, the second earl, that's it for her. She becomes a dowager, countess, mm. and all of a sudden she has to move out of various <laughs> properties. Oh, gosh. And her husband dies because it goes to the next Earl and Countess, oh, of course. course. Yeah. You always think of the poor dowager duchesses and dowager mm. countesses. As soon as your husband, as long as your husband's alive, you are the Chatelain. Yeah. As soon as he dies, you get kicked off oh, to yeah. a cottage somewhere quite often. Yes, quite, yeah. And it certainly happened to Caroline. Yeah. Caroline yeah, was well, yeah, yeah, that's, that's an untold story of, of dowagers, isn't it? Of what happens to them. Yeah, because yeah, the, the new the new generation goes in, takes over, and they've got this little sort of hangover from the previous regime tucked away in a corner somewhere. Yeah, it's fine. Yolo, uh, Yolo, Morgan, <coughs> Yolo, Yolo Morganug did write to her saying that he had discovered that Dunraven Castle was actually the fortress of Bran the Blessed which we will talk about in a little while. Oh. So she maintained mm. her relationship with Yolo of Glamorgan uh, that her mm. father had enjoyed. But remember, uh, these are now essentially an Irish family that have taken over Dunraven. So it's not a surprise oh. that they spent a lot of time in Ireland and they mm. were not full time in Glamorgan at this period. The younger son would be MP for Glamorgan, but the Earl of mm. Dunraven spent a lot of time uh, in County Limerick at a huge manor now a five-star hotel that was actually built called a Dare Manor, which we'll look at in a little while. But here's Yolo. Mm. Ah. Edward Williams, as you can see. Yeah. Now, Yolo is a controversial character, but one that I'm rather um, fond of. Uh, he almost single-handedly recreated Welsh culture. Yes. In the early 19th century. And his relationship with the Dunravens is fascinating because he appears to have thought that he was like the medieval bard to Caroline's father. Ah, interesting. Piers the Dunravens yeah. paid Yolo as well. Mm. So Yolo came up with all sorts of uh, interesting ideas. Mm. Um, he did an awful lot of work. He was a brilliant man, Yolo Morganug. He, mm. he truly was. But he was found guilty of forging documents. Mm. 
And so, but I do love what actually Gareth Thomas, who wrote a novel a couple of years ago called I Yolo, wrote of, about mm -hmm. him. Gareth Thomas writes, it's wrong to call him just a forger. Yolo Morganug forged an entire literary tradition. Maybe yeah. he was a forger, but he was the perpetrator of the most successful act of literary forgery in European history. That is worth celebrating. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> So it's not just a little bit of a tinker with an occasional document. <laughs> it's because not. <laughs> oh, gosh, grand endeavor. <laughs> of course, he's most famous for the Eisteddfod movement, isn't he? And uh, Druids. But doing the yeah. first Eisteddfod on yeah, yeah. Primrose Hill in London. He, that was Yolo. Yeah, it, it's, it's a little frustrating because Yolo was an extraordinary man who did a lot of great work. And in fact, a lot of people calling him a fraud. I mean, he may have got a lot of his information through the oral tradition which isn't stated, but it is it is absolutely proven that he did forge documents. So there is always a slight cloud, of course, of a YOLO. Um, but as this bard to the Dunravens, now look at this, Goff. This oh. is the coat of arms of the Earls of yeah. Dunraven. And this we is fascinating. Videre. Hmm. I want to see what is up. Yeah. I want to see what is beyond. I'll see what is beyond, yeah. But these were added later in the early 19th century, and they are ravens. Ravens. Oh. Yeah, we've talked they're about ravens. They're very peculiar looking ravens, aren't they? They, they sort are. of almost like, yeah, the, the, the way the breast is pressed up against the edge of the thing, they look like sort of heraldic beasts rather than ravens. No, they have brought ravens uh, <coughs> into this. Mm. Now, of course, Dun Raven has nothing to do with ravens, as we said. It is yeah. you know, Dindrivan the Fortress of Three Rocks. So why have they brought ravens into this? Well, they brought ravens mm. into this probably because of Yolo, who says that oh. Dunraven Castle was the original fortress of Bran, who is this mythical character or legendary character of mm. Celtic mythology. He appears in the Mabinogion and Bran, Bran ap Lear, mm. Bran is a raven deity. Oh, I never knew that one. My God, in my I thought he was a, a giant, a giant, don't they? And he's supposed to lie over the Irish Sea and they, they, the armies walk over the top of him? Or have I got no, a the, different the, brand? The Irish, <laughs> there is an Irish connection, but they think he was originally the god of mariners, which again, oh. uh, but he even appears oh, in some... Oh, that's interesting. He appears in some the as, the, as the guardian of the Holy Grail, as the Fisher King, in a couple of accounts. Uh, Bran means crow in Welsh, so it's not quite raven, yeah. but I do think that it means raven in Cornish, Irish, and Scots Gaelic. Oh, interesting. Now, it's, now he wrote, right, saying the primary residence of Bran was Dunraven Castle, and ravens became seen. It is very esoteric, actually, of the Dunravens. They, now, mm. they may well have seen ravens as the spirit of Bran the Blessed, and they've adopted them as their heraldic uh, sort of beast, you could say. Mm. Uh, Bran had his head cut off. Um, and while his head was cut off after fighting in Ireland, coming mm. back to Britain, Bran's head continued to chat to the people <laughs> who were taking <laughs> him back. Yeah, I remember, I remember that. <laughs> and he was buried at the Tower of London. The idea of a headless deity yeah. buried at the Tower of London where lots of people lost their heads. Yeah. And you've got the raven attached to the Tower of London as well. Yeah. It's very interesting. Oh, yeah, interesting. Yeah. But that oh, whole yeah, legend. Oh, yeah, that is interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's a very interesting connection. That whole oh. legend, which is said to, to date from Charles II, that if the last raven leaves the Tower of yeah. London, the kingdom will fall, that really only dates from the Edwardian era. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, gosh. And who supplied the ravens in the Edwardian era but the yeah. Earl of Dunraven? Oh, good Lord. Oh, well, 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 well. Hey, this is it, very intriguing, this, isn't it? I'm well impressed by this one. It became Hello. the idea that almost, always was also filtered across this headless thing with Bran and the sort of ancestors of Dunraven. At one point, they even suggested that if you had your head cut off at the Tower of London, um, it was a good idea to pay for a raven because your spirit would enter the raven. So it's getting deep waters at this point, isn't it? Gosh, yeah. But Blimey. this continues in modern literature. If anyone has read any of George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire or watch Game of Thrones on TV, he has a character called Bran who communes mm. with a three-eyed raven. 
and he can oh, enter yeah. uh he can enter beasts uh physically yeah. and spiritually so again it all comes from bran which according yeah. to yolo all comes from dunraven does that make all any sense from yeah why would you say it is it's very fascinating interesting there's an interesting thing about heads as well isn't there um mm. in celtic tradition we discovered this a couple of years ago mm. uh, in relation to something we were looking into at tradiga house wasn't it about the the, the the heads of an en enemies being taken and placed by springs mm. and placed by spring heads and things like that or you would actually carry the, the heads of your enemy you'd stack them outside out, outside the the front of your house or you'd carry them tied to the pommel of your horse and all sorts of things very 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 uh that the head seems seen as a seat of of uh of spiritual and, and uh, power is quite interesting mm. particularly as the head's taken and placed, you know, in, in logically, in no, notionally, in the Tower of London. That means you not only have you killed your enemy, but you've placed their power at your command in the site of your principal fortresses. That's Very intriguing. Interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, in the early nineteenth and mid nineteenth century, coal is found on the Dunraven's Glamorgan mm. estates. Uh, they spend a lot of time in Ireland at this time, as I say, and they rebuild their Irish home. Uh, called Adair Manor, which you mm. can see here. This is Adair Manor. And it was, oh. it's, a, it's a very large building. That doesn't quite give it credit. If we look at its great hall. Oh, heavens. <laughs> yeah, that's a, well, well, well. I should say, by the way, if you are from Glamorgan, uh, it's now a five-star hotel, one of Ireland's oh. best hotels, Adair Manor. Uh, because it was built using Glamorgan coal, you might get a discount. It's worth asking, I think. <laughs> But always worth checking. there is a remnant of what we've been talking about, how the uh, Dunravens did take this Yolo's words to heart about the mm. raven and how it's a sacred entity for the family. Because if you go up the stairs of a dear manor, even to this day, you find an extraordinary sight which makes no sense unless you understand what Yolo was saying and what mm. we've just been saying, because you find these rather sinister things. Oh, the ravens. Ravens. Oh, yeah, good lord. <laughs> Intriguing, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Yeah, these ravens are, in, in, I said, they're fascinating because they're, they're singularly birds of ill omen. There's nothing good about them whatsoever <laughs> uh, in, in any form of mythology that they have ever have a positive streak to them. It's fascinating. By the way, this, this Adair Manor is called a calendar house. Have you ever heard of a calendar house? Because I hadn't. No, calendar I haven't. house. It's got 365 leaded windows, 52 ornate chimneys, seven stone pillars and four oh. towers to mark the tally of days, weeks and seasons in a year. It's a calendar. Oh, okay. house. Yeah. oh that's brilliant. <laughs> no, I never heard of that at all. <laughs> Dear old Caroline can't go on forever and nor can her husband. Yeah. And when he dies, Edwin who was MP for Glamorgan, of course he was. Mm. The third Earl takes over, the third Earl of Dunraven. Mm. We're now in the middle of the 19th century. Intriguing man, he converted to Catholicism. Mm. Um, he was involved in astronomy, but his great passion was archeology. span He helped found the Irish Archaeology, Archaeological Society, fellow mm. of the Royal Geographical Society, fellow of the Royal Society. But one of his interests, Goff, which you know, was spiritualism. Yes. Hmm. And he asked his son, Lord Adair is the courtesy title for the heir to the Earldom of Dunraven. Hmm. So he's the Earl of Dunraven. His son, the future Earl, um, Wyndham, is this chap, Lord hmm. Adair. Now, I hmm. think with this whole spiritualism sort of thing off, I will hand it over to you. Oh, okie dokie. Yes, it's um, fascinating. The, the Earl, the Earl, uh, Adair's father had got into spiritualism following the wave of interest that occurred in mesmerism, which was around. And mesmerism, as well as being seen as a sort of early form of hypnotism and putting people into trances and all, all this sort of business, comes from a, a Dr. Mesmer. Um, it started to move into communication with spirits towards the end of its, of its manifestation of interest. So, so then, so out of that, out of the his interest in mesmerism, he becomes interested in spiritualism. An awful lot of sort of scientists at the time and, and writers and things at the time became very interested 
in in the subject of communication with spirits and survival beyond. So it was quite a, it was a pseudoscience. A lot of early sort of psychic research associations crop up at this period, the Dialectic Club and uh, the Athenaeum Guild and all these sort of things crop up to try and investigate it and get involved in it. They're precursors of the Psychic Research Society. Um, but Adair as a young man, Viscount Adair as a young man, becomes very, very uh, involved in the study of it. But particularly uh, with this gentleman, let me put the screen up for you so you can see what's going on. Uh, Adair becomes involved with this man, um, uh, Donglas. Uh, oh, beg your pardon. My brain is frozen on his first name now. Daniel. Daniel Donglas Hume. Daniel Donglas Hume. Very splendid. And an alarmy stock photo. Hoorah! Um, Hooray! Yeah, hoorah! Donglas Hume is a is a, a puzzle. Um, he was became a very very prominent psychic. Um, they were Scots family believed to be de uh, descended from a, as an illegitimate son of Alexander the 10th Earl of Hume. So uh, Hume throughout his life had a, a, a degree of a sort of um, slight affectation of aristocratic tendencies because of this. Um, he was very, very notorious at the period. The family had had a, a background, a tradition in Scotland of being seers. Um, particularly many of his predecessors, his great uncle Colin Urquhart and uncle, uh, an uncle called Mr. Mackenzie, all had the gift of the second sight, believed to be a curse by some people because it foretold tragedy. Um, eventually, sort of, uh, his father passed away and his mother couldn't support all the family because they had eight children. So uh, Hume goes off to an aunt uh, who, had, who had no children, um, a cook, Mary Cook, and her husband. And they, they eventually, they move off to America and they, they emigrate and they head off to that point. So as a young man, he spends his time in America, in Connecticut area, parts of New York floating around. And by the time he's 18, he starts to get a reputation. He starts performing seances. Now, this is around the same time as the Fox sisters have originated um, uh, spiritualism. You may remember the Fox sisters would hold... Um, meetings at their house uh, where they would there would be wrappings at the table and the table itself would move around table turning as it was called still went on right in the victorian period table turning um later it was revealed of course that the taps were caused by them cracking their toe joints underneath the table oh but it didn't really stop people <laughs> <laughs> they they owned up to it. They said, no, it has to be very, very, you know, we just crack in the joints of our toes under the table for tapping it. Um, they suffered from another company called Hammer Toe, which apparently can create a lot of cracks. But this became quite fashionable. So he seems to take on, the, you know, whether he genuinely believed this or not, lots of traditions that as a child, his cradle rocked itself mm. and all these various things. But he starts to, uh, to essentially conduct seances. He never charged money for them, but basically he was patronized by a lot of very, very wealthy people, a lot of subscriptions, a lot of societies put money into it. So he lived very, very comfortably and quite high off the hog um, in these areas. But he certainly worked for it. I mean, at one point he was doing something like seven seances a day in somebody's household and people were flooding in to actually get these things. And then he moves over to Europe and at which point he comes into contact with Adair. Now, Adair, later on in years to come, goes on to write this book, which becomes a famous account of it. And this is called Experiences in Spiritualism with Mr. D. D. Hume by Viscount Adair. Now, the introduction, you see, is written by his father, is mm. the Earl of Dunraven, who writes about 20 pages of a quite serious description of it. Now, the, the book itself, which was published privately, more or less as a sort of vanity project, eventually it gets republished in the 1920s as well. But it details bit by bit all the seances over a two year period that Adair attended with Hume. Um, they come out of letters that he sent back to his father. So they are a, a scientific study or anything. They are quite objective. They're not hysterical. Um, but he obviously does buy way into what Hume's doing and how, it, how it's going on. In, in, the, in the introduction to the book, he gives a nice sort of idea of what he, he felt about it. So this is from the introduction that uh, Adair wrote to a later edition of his book. 
when he says, I came across Mr. D.D. Hume long ago in Paris. I forget under what circumstances, but they had nothing to do with spiritualism or with his mediumship. My meeting him again in 1867 was fortuitous. Circumstances in the shape of rheumatism or rheumatic gout led me to Dr. Gully's hydropathic establishment at Malvern. And there I became acquainted with Mr. Hume, who was staying with Dr. Gully as a guest. I was attracted by some phenomena which took place immediately. I liked Mr. Hume. He had the defects of an emotional character with vanity highly developed, perhaps wisely to enable him to hold his own against the ridicule and obloquy that was then poured out upon spiritualism and everyone connected with it. He was liable to fits of great depression and to nervous crises difficult at first to understand. But he was withal of a simple, kindly, humorous, lovable disposition that appealed to me. <laughs> I struck up an intimate friendship with him and spent a great deal of time during the next two years in his company, with the result that the phenomena which are here recorded occurred at all times and seasons, under all sorts of conditions, in broad daylight, in artificial light, in semi-darkness, at regular seances, unpremeditatedly without any seance at all, indoors, out of doors, in private houses, in hotels, at home and abroad. And it is probable that to that extent these experiences are peculiar. Yeah, I think that's the, probably a great misunderstatement. The reason he goes through all that list of all these things is that a lot of the accusations directed at Hume, the law of law, what he did, and all about these science, the seances were conducted were in you know, conditions of poor light to darkness. So he's making the case that they're not all set up, they're not all prearranged, they're not all in the semi-darkness of things. Mm. But a lot of them, a lot of these things were. Hume became a huge celebrity in um, at this period. Um, if you were, well, spiritualism itself and um, and um, and seances have became a sort of after dinner treat in the mid Victorian period um, for the aristocracy. It had always been there, but it had been sort of slightly middle class. Hmm. A lot of the mediums weren't of the top draw. There was a lady called Mrs. Marshall who was very popular at one point, but considered a bit of a joke because she was a bit rough and ready and a little bit sort of middle class pretensions. At one point, an actor turned up at one of the seances and took the mickey out of her by falling into a trance himself, rolling on the floor and frothing at the mouth through chewing a bit of soap and eventually bitter on the ankle. Oh. So they didn't take her seriously hmm. at all, Mrs. Marshall. Hmm. But Hume didn't seem to get that because he was a little bit, he had these sort of affectations of aristocracy himself. So he fitted in with a higher level of it. So this is when the, this is when the aristocratic families of the country and the upper, the, the richer people, and even the, the royalty at some levels get involved in it. So he's part of this very top end market of what's going on with these various things. Now, when this book was published, there's a, a, a great sort of review of it in, uh, let me just check the name of the paper here. Um, in the Dublin Evening Mail, when they talk about the contents of the book. Um, and they break down the sort of things that, that happened in it. Um, it says uh, chairs, sofas, tables, books move about the room from place to place of their own accord. And it seemed to rise into the air. In 14 instances, flowers are brought by invisible hands and given to different persons. The fragrance is taken from flowers and thrown about the room. Brandy rises from a glass into the air. That is, it disappears from the glass, which is quite empty, then falls out of space into the glass again through Lord Adair's fingers. The spirit was taken out of the brandy and just left, left the water. In 23 instances, spirit forms were visible. In 13, spirit hands were seen, and cases of spirit hands touching persons are recorded in 20 other places. Spirit voices are heard in nine instances. Now, this is very, very... I mean, whenever you get to spirit hands, you're into trouble. I'll come back to those. Remember your spirit hands. But one of the most famous cases that um, since it took place with Hume, which has never been adequately explained, um, is described by Adair, and it's an incident which took place um, at Ashley House. So he says Ashley House, it's a, a little bit confused, the, some of the details when people place it in different places. But essentially, it's that he, um, he was very prone to levitating Hume. Um, prone to he, levitating. Prone to levitating. <laughs> okay. as you, would. you couldn't keep him in a chair for mm. five minutes. Also, he would elongate and shrink, which is quite oh. interesting as well. He could stretch by six inches and then contract by about the I same could do with that. 
<laughs> you could. We could. You could get on a couple of inches or two. We'd have to get you proper mediumistic training. Um, but actually, as the president says, I, I took um, um, uh, humor seemed to rise into the air four or five feet. Uh, then he was raised to the ha to the back of Lord Adair's chair, who said, I took both his feet in my hands, and away he went, up into the air so high that I was obliged to let go of his feet. He was carried along the wall, brushing past the pictures, to the opposite side of the room. Then he called me over to him. I took his hand and felt him alight upon the floor. So he's not just bobbing up in the air. He's floating around the entire room at this point, which is all very interesting. And in fact, there he is, Hello! bobbing up. Wow. quite cheerfully in the room now again this these spend this is all very intriguing um because i mean, i have no doubt at all that this is pure chicanery of course. Pure, but it takes a deal of preparation mm. and a deal of a somebody needs to know what's going on here there's a case of him of, of david records of him levitating a piano oh. i mean that's not a light object to lift it goes up about a foot in the air eventually mm. Now, whatever you're setting up to, to affect this, you, you know, it takes a deal of preparation to be doing, and it takes a deal of, you know, accomplices to going on with it. So it isn't someone taking the mickey over someone solely what's going on. But again, one of the big cases is, is he when Hume levitates out of a window. And now I've got a, a little thing for you to have a look at here. Let me just, well, I'll stop the screen share just for a moment. This is one of a book, if you have interest in Victorian seances, called The Table Wrappers. The Table Wrappers. And it goes mm. through the whole business of what the Victorian um, scene was about in regards to it. Um, but this is the incidents that became quite famous for Hume. Um, and it says, the levitation of mediums was a more difficult problem. The most famous instance of this was accomplished by Hume, who levitated at a house in Victoria in front of a goggling audience, floated out of one window and in at another. It happened after Hume had been pontificating on the nature of justice. In human affairs, let human justice prevail, but we cannot interfere. God's justice is so different from man's. Um, he then became both elevated and elongated and requested... <laughs> Do not be afraid, on a no account, leave your places. Hello. Um, he went out into the passage. One of the viewers said, oh, good heavens, I know what he is going to do. It is too fearful. Possible plant in the audience there. Um, Lord Adair asked what it was, but it was too horrible. Um, then the spirit of Adam Menken said that Adair could be told. Adam Menken was a notorious bareback rider who apparently caused a stir in an adaptation of Byron poem and was the mistress of Dumas, allegedly to the poet Swinburne. That, that was his sort of spirit medium, a spirit uh, guide, shall we say. Uh, Hume was going out one window and in at theirs. They heard the window thrown up and Hume appeared outside their window, standing upright. He opened the window and walked in. He laughed and they asked him why he was laughing and he was wondering apparently what a policeman would have done had one been passing and looking up. He then gave a repeat performance, passing out of the window, almost horizontally and apparently rigid. Um, it was dark and Adair could not see if he was supporting himself at the balustrade. Afterwards, there were other phenomena, jets of flames proceeding from Hume's head and a whistling and chirping sound as from an invisible bird flying around the room. Hope it's a raven. I hope it's a raven, yes. Now, a problem with all this, again, it's dark. People aren't seeing what's going on. A lot, awful lot of it gets later elaborated. Uh, people say, he was 85 foot up in the air. No, he possibly about 35 foot up in the air. It's still 35 foot, mine. Um, there's argument about the ledge outside the window, whether it was four and a half inches, whether it was one and a half inches. Latterly, when we investigating the case, realised that if you were stepped out onto the window ledge, all you had to do was step over a four foot gap and you'd be on the edge of the other window and just step into the room. Nobody ever sees him actually float past outside. So it's more possible he just somehow went out the window. They used to, they used to pretend some levitation exercise. It's the most ridiculous thing you imagine. But they'd actually put shoes on their, on their hands and stick their hands out in front of them like that. As if they were levitating, Ooh, and they lean back, and, it, and as if they were like this, levitating. It was the most ridiculous thing. Long winter away. evenings, eh? Long winter evenings in the semi darkness. But this is the most famous incident because it was often said of Hume, although of all of them, he was the one who was never detected um, in fraud. Hmm. Now, this is not true. 
Right. He was detected on a number of occasions up to things he shouldn't have been. But it was hushed up because the people that he was doing it for didn't wish to appear fools. Mm. Um, as uh, he said, uh, apparently he was detected once. Um, <laughs> this is the most ridiculous thing. If you were sitting at the table, spirits would tug your clothing. <gasps> So he's there between the Empress Emperor Napoleon III and the Empress, Ooh. and her dress is tugged. And the guy opposite the table looks under the table and realizes that Hume's taken his shoe off. He's got a sock on which he's cut all the toes out. He slipped his shoe off and he's just tugging a dress with his toes. Mm. Another occasion, a spirit hand or spirit figure appears at the edge of the table, glowing there. And the guy grabs it and it's his foot. He stuck his foot up over the edge of the table, coated in phosphorus, because that's where a lot of these spirits' hands come. Phosphorus, phosphorescent oil. They, they would coat the hand in oil. And then in the semi-darkness, this ghost hand. So he's a talented, in, in a lot of cases, he's a talented magician. I mean, he could have made yes, money you as would, a magician. There's a, there's, ever, there's a lot in this today that bears comparison to some of the street magicians you see today, people like Di uh, Dynamo and people like this, who go into mm. small public spaces or close spaces, very close work, and do incredible things. Mm. But again, they're not purporting to have psychic powers. They're purporting to be, you know, what they are, ma magicians. Mm. So it is... Let's get pop back and have a look at it. It is a difficult thing to, to feel for people. Eventually, um, he comes <laughs> a cropper. Hume, in the Miss, the notorious Mrs. Lyons case. Um, right. There's a little description of Mrs. Lyons, if I can find her here. Um, Mrs. Lyons was 75 years old, hysterical, illegitimate, and shabby. Um, she was rich. <laughs> she had married in 1823. Her husband had died in 1859, and he left her a large sum of money, and she had between 15,000 and 20,000 pounds of her own. Before he died, Lyon had told his wife that he would show she would only survive him by seven years, and the seven years were up. In an effort to avert this stroke of ill luck, Mrs. Lyon went to see a man called Sims, who put her directly onto Hume. Now, it's very interesting, because as soon as she goes to see Hume, whose career was slightly under the skids, um, Mr. Lyons comes through and points out that, really, um, Hume is actually his spiritual son, oh, and they right. need to adopt him. Um, so she, and, and, and to support him. So Mrs. Lyon gives him 50 quid. That wasn't quite up to scratch. So when he visits again, Mr. Lyons comes back through from the ether and says it'd probably be better to give him 700, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> so and eventually, and eventually there, there, there's sums of 30 grand being passed over, deeds. Um, he says he has to adopt the name of Lyons. Um, Mrs. Lyons starts to refer to him as her son, her spiritual son. She gets a bit clingy. He's not very happy with it. And as soon as he sort of points out she's not getting any more than an occasional cutch, um, <laughs> it goes to court. And of course, all of this comes out of court. Mrs. Lyons is a, bless her heart, a very ridiculous figure. And he is just revealed as well as someone who was taking advantage oh, of, of a poor and of a deluded woman, basically. Oh. Um, his wife, when he died, wrote this wonderful book called The Gift of Dee Dee Hume by Madame Hume to attempt to salvage his very, very soiled reputation by this point. But this is long, long after Adair had, had, had ceased his two right. years association right. with him. It is quite intriguing what Adair <clears throat> made of it um, and what he thought about it all, mm -hmm. when, particularly when the, 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 the revelations of sort of cheating and things came out because they were quite convinced they even even despite all this they remain convinced in in the genuineness of a lot of uh, the phenomena that he produced and also the genuineness of, of spiritualism which was again it goes it goes in in waves interest mm -hmm. in this i think i was chatting to you the other day about things and saying we're due for another surge in interest yes you did say because, that well it, it follows periods of national crisis if it came after the first world war and, and mm -hmm. how we know we still are going through you know a, a very tragic period of loss that would be surprising a couple of years time things will start ticking up again hopefully there won't be many people like hume around yeah to take advantage of it well, let's hope not so, uh, let's uh, but hope. i mean yes hume took advantage of it but the adairs and dunravens were a patron at least oh yeah 
So we've got this one. This is the this is, as you say, Lord Adair. His father dies in 1871 and he becomes the fourth Earl. And he is the most extraordinary man. Hmm. He is the man that, quite frankly, we you could do an entire podcast on. He flits from Dunraven Castle to Adair Manor and back again. Um, but he was a war correspondent with the Daily Telegraph, possibly the only man to witness the signing of both treaties of Versailles. The famous one that ends the First World War in 1919, but he was at the Treaty of Versailles, which ended the Franco-Prussian War in 1871. He was at both of them. Gosh. He created Dunraven's sharpshooters for the Boer War, his own, um, his own, uh, and he oh, went with them, his own regiment, mm. and he was mentioned in dispatches. He was, uh, let's see how he looks in society. There he is. <laughs> if you want to know what society he was, no. he was under Secretary of State for the Colonies under Lord Salisbury. So he's the most successful politician of the Dunravens. And here he is in some exalted company. Chatting with, ah. the, here he is, chatting with the Kaiser. Yeah. And of course, with Edward VII. 30. He was involved in yachting. Yeah. Uh, he loved yachting, but racing. He liked oh, racing right. yachts, so not pleasure yachts, steam yachts, racing yachts. He liked to win prizes, and he did win prizes. He had three yachts called Valkyrie, and he was successful, as you can see here. Um, this, this is one of the awards oh. presented by Queen Victoria, by the uh, hmm. looks of it. And uh, here we have Valkyrie, and he entered, oh. the, he entered the America's Cup on more Gosh. than one occasion. Now... He lost once in 1895, and it could be suggested that dear old fourth Earl of Dunraven may have taken it badly. He accused the Americans of cheating, and there he is, hurling mud at the Americans. <laughs> <laughs> As Valkyrie merrily capsizes. <laughs> oh dear, you're the donkey's ears. Oh, that's terrible, isn't it? It's a little harsh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here he is, dressed to be dashing in society. Uh, at Dunraven Castle at this time, people such as uh, Joseph Chamberlain would turn up, and one of his closest friends, Winston's father, Lord Randolph Churchill, would be at Dunraven Castle during this period. Um, the America's Cup, by the way, Goff, finally entered Lord Dunraven into its Hall of Fame in 2016. Oh, <laughs> Like me. <laughs> yeah. They must have been very annoyed about the accusation of cheating then. That's all I can Just say. a little bit. It took a while to get him in. He <laughs> was on top of the technology. He um, also has a Stradivarius, still used by a classical musician to this day, called the Lord oh. Dunraven, because he bought it in 1890. Hmm. He also has a road in Mayfair named after him, Dunraven Road, which was named hmm. after him. That's where P.G. Woodhouse used to live when he was in England. And oh, here he is dressed for society. And here he is, for some reason, dressed as Cardinal Mazarin. <laughs> as you do. <laughs> He's not that popular in America, though, I must concede. Indeed, hmm. at one time, he was known as the most hated man in Colorado. Bit of a blow. <laughs> Quite. Uh, he had a little place in Colorado, and this is it. Uh, psh, blimey. Yeah. Hey, he was a big game hunter. He knew Buffalo Bill Cody when he was in America. <laughs> he explored Yellowstone Park and he bought, somewhat illegally, 15,000 acres in Colorado, now known as the entire Estes Park, part of the Rocky Mountain Range National Park, as his own private game preserve, where he built a wooden hotel. Uh, the problem was you weren't allowed to do that. So to get around it, he got people to buy little small holdings who would then immediately sell it to the Earl of Dunraven. Oh, gosh. It was known as the biggest single land grab in Colorado history. Yeah. Good God. <laughs> and in the end, settlers arrived and he said it was constant litigation, people kicking up mm. rows, so we sold up. Mm. He had an interested sort of relationship really with America. Um, at one point, he was he was in America and he, he wrote interesting books on America and Colorado, which you can still read. But he on a walk, he lost his whiskey flask from his pocket. So he retraced his route, which could be miles, you know, in Colorado. Yeah. And he found his flask and he also found his wallet stuffed with money that he didn't know he lost. <laughs> and at that point, he vowed never to join the temperance society. <laughs> 
the most startling of all of the fourth Earl of Dunraven's adventures in America was when he writes this. Colonel Custer invited me to join him on a punitive expedition against the Indians. Unluckily, as I thought, but fortunately, as it turned out, I received the invitation too late. The whole outfit was wiped out. Custer's <laughs> last stand at the Battle of Little Bighorn. He had an invite which didn't turn up in time. <laughs> <laughs> I can get an invitation to it though. You did from Custer, yeah. It do pop along. <laughs> yeah. He did. Extraordinary man. Um, but but he's blamed for everything in Colorado. Now there's a Stanley Hotel that's main ghost is always called It's Bound to be Lord Dunraven. <laughs> Which is a little harsh, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Look how wild Dunraven Castle is, though, when you've got this. Oh, did it, yeah. Dunraven Bay. And he, he kept going back there. Um, he didn't die. During the First World War, he bought a steam yacht to convert into a hospital ship to do his bit. Oh, now, yeah. he didn't have a hospital ship which he converted. He bought one for the occasion. It was about a quarter the size of Lord Tredegar's famous hospital ship, Steam Yacht Liberty. But nevertheless... He certainly showed will in, I think, the Earl of Dunraven. Mm. He gave up. Uh, he allowed Dunraven Castle to become a military hospital in the First World War, which had 80 beds. And in fact, long after he died in 1926, it was a military hospital in the Second World War as well. Oh, gosh. Where a lot of the staff complained that the Blue Lady was frequently seen. Patients and staff were sort of found this blue lady off put in, but no one has been able to explain what legend the blue lady actually tied into. Yeah, so we're not well, quite sure about that. So he dies in 1926. More Earls of Dunraven come. But what do you do with a place sort of this size? I mean, it still looks very impressive, as you can see. Hmm. So what they decide ultimately, a future Earl of Dunraven leases it to the Workers Tourist Authority in the 50s, and it becomes a guest house. So they've gone back to Ireland. This becomes a guest house, a yeah. very grand one. And there you are, the WTA guest house, Dunraven Castle. You're near the beach. Mm -hmm. All very splendid. Yeah, of course. Great, there's a great one here from the 50s where you can see the cars in the car park that's appeared. Yes. Dunraven Castle is still up yeah. there. And it's still quite grand. I mean, you can see, there it is. His Lordship's Lounge in the guest house. Yeah. And his Lordship's Armoury is still there oh. as well in the early 1960s. Hmm. It's a big old place, though, isn't it? Hmm. Oh, it's, uh, yeah, a little chunk. And this is the problem with these sorts of things, Goff, as we've talked about many times. What do you do with a place that large and rambling in the dreaded 50s and 60s when it comes mm. to how people treat mm. architecture. We know how much we lost. Lanwern and all mm. of those houses lost in the 50s and 60s. Well, one of the Earls of Dunraven came up with the idea that maybe 800 caravans could actually be put in mm. this area. And the local authority turned him down. And ultimately, oh. I guess you know where I'm going with this. This is the picture of Dunraven Castle before demolition. In oh. 1962 to 1963. Gosh. Oh, dear me, dear me. The Ravens oh, couldn't me. save it from the 60s yeah. bulldozers. And here it is today. Oh, gosh, you're completely gone. Oh, oh dear me. It still has the wall gardens, which have been yeah. restored and open to the public. But you can just see where the yeah. castle footprint was. Yeah. It still stands yeah. oh, in this majestic God. part yeah. of the Vale of Glamorgan. But it's such a shame. Uh, mm. But we say this a lot, don't we? I mean, it, it's, yes, yeah. it's kind of what happens. There are still bits. There's the gatehouse, which is still there. One of the lodges is what it really was. Mm. And the, there is a little tower you can see here. Yes, I can, yes. Which was their ice house. Oh, it, right. It oh, an, it was an ice tower rather than yeah. an ice house. Yeah. Their watchtower probably rather than this, was, which was probably still in use, in the Edwardian era was turned into a smoking room. So you found this sort of crumbling battlements of a tower, but when you went in, it's ceiling, it's like a conservatory. Oh, and it gosh. was very grand as yeah. a smoking room. So a, a ruin from outside, but a yeah. perfectly functional and comfortable gentleman yeah. smoking room inside. Yeah. Gosh. But yep, things I suppose do end, don't they? 
And yeah, uh, yes, yeah. Dunraven yeah, came yeah. a cropper. Yeah. If there's one thing you learn from this program is that <laughs> nothing lasts forever. <laughs> it's nothing a, lasts it's forever. It's a whiff of mortality you know, about the whole thing, really, isn't it? Yeah. What a, what a shame. What a fantastic place it was. Oh, what a pity. What a great pity. Have you ever been there? No, 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 I didn't. No, I haven't been there. I might, might have to try and have a little look at some, some point. I mean, things gradually opening up a little bit more, get the car out and have a little poop. Be nice. Yeah, well, you could I was just looking at, it, and then, looking at the uh, um, right at the very beginning. You mentioned something about the triangular port or something. Was it called? Yeah, it's one of the theories of what uh, uh, Din Drivan uh, and yeah. the original. If you look name. at if you look at the landscape there, that headland could is a tri is you know you, is triangular, and there's actually a great go dip from one side to the other in it. That where, where you have like the walled garden that that's on the edge of this dip, this gouge. So it's possible that that's that's where they they cut off the headland with a defensive ditch area, because it's something that you tend to see in headlands. There's a, a ditch from one side to the other of a promontory, and beyond it is where you get the the settlement area. So yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Now you can actually see that in the landscape. You saw it in the last picture you looked at very. Clearly. And of course, we don't know what's been lost to uh, coastal erosion. Uh, oh yeah, <coughs> which, which probably adds to it as well. So. That was Dunraven uh, Castle. There's, there's lots online. I mean, we could have gone on for hours about Dunraven. Mm. There's all kinds of interesting things. There's a very good blog which mentions Dunraven by Louvain Rees, and I'll put the link to her blog down mm. below so you can have a little look. But yeah. as far as we're concerned, that about wraps it up, Goff. Yeah. So thank oh, you yeah, very so much. Oh, just as a corollary, if you are interested in reading Lord Adair's book on his adventures with Hume, you can actually get that um, on Kindle. There's a Kindle version available. Oh. Um, that's where I got the, the quote from the, the book from. So I, I downloaded my free sample and, uh, and, there, and there it is at the beginning. So, yeah, you, if you're interested, you can go and get his experiences in spiritualism with D.D. Hume. Fascinating. All right. Well, we will be back fairly soon. I mean, this was to keep us busy during lockdown and lockdown is sort of coming to an end now. So we'll see how we go. But at the moment, we're still getting a few views, so we'll still keep going. So thank you very much for joining us. Okay. and We shall see you next time.